Here's what's coming up on The World Today. The much-awaited Sue Gray report is finally out, revealing failures in leadership of number 10 Downing Street. <laughs> EU leaders prepare to meet over the escalation of the Ukraine-Russia crisis. Plus, 19 people die in Brazil flash floods. A warm welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. The much awaited report into parties at Downing Street has finally been released, saying there were failures of leadership and judgments in Number 10 and the Cabinet Office. Some lines that stand out in the document are against the backdrop of the pandemic when the government was asking citizens to accept far reaching restrictions on their lives. Some of the behavior surrounding these gatherings is difficult to justify. Another says at least some of the gatherings in question represent a serious failure to observe not just the high standards expected of those working at the heart of government, but also the standards expected of the entire British population at the time at least some of the gatherings in question represent a serious failure to observe not just the high standards expected of those working at the heart of government, but also the standards expected of the entire British population at the time. It also says at times it seems there were too little thought given to what was happening across the country in considering the appropriateness of some of these gatherings, the, risky, uh, the risks they presented to public health and how they might appear to the public. At times it seems there was too little thought given to what was happening across the country in considering the appropriateness of some of these gatherings, uh, the risk that uh, they portend. So... Also, the 12-page report makes clear that some of the events in Downing Street over the lockdown should not have been allowed to take place in the first place, whilst others should not have been allowed to develop as they did. It says number 10 was used for gatherings without clear authorization or oversight, and this was not appropriate. As expected, there have been re uh, reactions to the report. Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy says the conclusions show the Prime Minister is a coward, a rule breaker, and needs to step down. Leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Ed Davies, says the PM broke the rules and lied to the country. Earlier today, the Prime Minister told reporters to wait and see. But just a while ago, he delivered a statement to Parliament apologising. Mr Speaker, I want to apologise. I know that millions of people... permission I would like to make a statement and first I want to express my deepest gratitude to Sue Gray and all the people who have contributed to this report which I have placed in the library of this house and which the government has published in full today for everyone to read. I will address its findings in this statement but firstly I want to say sorry and I'm sorry for the things we simply didn't get right and also sorry for the way that this matter has been handled. And it's no use saying that this or that was within the rules, and it's no use saying that people were working hard. This pandemic was hard for everyone. We asked people across this country to make the most extraordinary sacrifices, not to meet loved ones, not to visit relatives before they died. And I understand the anger that people feel. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson apologising to Parliament. We'll be discussing this in a minute. But let's switch gears now to the UN Security Council, which began session just a while ago for what is likely to be a confrontational debate between world powers over Russia's true build-up on the Ukrainian border. It's the first time the UN will discuss recent threats of a Russian invasion. Early on, Russia's ambassador to the UN, Vasily Nembezaya, called for a vote on whether the Security Council should hold the meeting on Ukraine. Today, Nebensaya says the meeting was called on unfounded accusations and talked about the myth of Russian aggression.
The U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, says Russian threats to Ukraine threaten Europe and called Moscow's actions aggressive behavior. She says Russia's 100,000 troops on Ukraine's border is the largest mobilization of troops in Europe in decades and that the U.S. is seeking the path of peace. She also says there are 10,000 Russian troops already in Belarus with heavy armaments. She expects there will be about 30,000 by early February. Now, also earlier today, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said he would tell Russian President Vladimir Putin to step back from the brink of a Ukraine when both leaders speak this week. He says, I will say, what I will say to President Putin, as I said before, is that I think we all really need to step back from the brink, and I think Russia needs to step back from the brink. Well, Russia, as we know, has amassed 120,000 troops near its border with Ukraine demanding that NATO withdraws troops and weapons from Eastern Europe and bar Ukraine, a former Soviet state, from ever joining the Western Defense Alliance. Moscow denies any plan to invade Ukraine. Russia annexed Crimea in 2014 and then backed rebels fighting government troops in Eastern Ukraine. I think that to the President Putin, as I've said before, is that I think we really all need to step back from the brink. And, and I think uh, Russia needs to step back from the brink. I think that an invasion of Ukraine and in any incursion uh, into Ukraine beyond the territory that uh, Russia has already taken in, in 2014 would be an absolute disaster for the world. But above all, it would be a disaster for Russia. As you know, the... Well, the Kremlin also said today that London's threat to introduce sanctions against Russian companies and businessmen linked to President Vladimir Putin are alarming and that such actions would backfire by hurting British companies. The British government said earlier today it would sanction businesses and people with the closest links to Putin if Russia takes any action against Ukraine. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskyov said the threat was an attack on Russian businesses undermined Britain's investment climate and inflamed tensions in Europe. Russia will respond to any such action in a way that would be based on its interests, according to Peskyov. Just a reminder of our lead story today, the Sue Gray report is finally out, damning Number 10's actions and the cabinet over the lockdown parties. Uh, it's said that at least some of the gatherings in question represent a serious failure to observe not just the high standards expected of those working at the heart of government, but also of the standards expected of the entire British population at the time. We heard the Prime Minister Boris Johnson give his apology uh, to Parliament just a while ago. Our London correspondent Juliana Olaika joins us now with more. Juliana, great to see you. And what a day, you know, in Parliament today. More about what Prime Minister Boris Johnson said today. He did apologise, but do the lawmakers believe him? Um, unfortunately not. Uh, no, Amarachi is the answer. Um, for, uh, it's not Prime Minister's questions. I suppose the House of Commons gathering is still ongoing. It's been pretty fiery. I've heard you read out some statements uh, from opposition uh, party members. But also as well, we have the dismissal from the House of Commons by um, Ian Blackford, uh, the Scottish National Party leader, who called the Prime Minister a liar, uh, refused to take back that statement. And then the Speaker, uh, was forced to kick him out. So it's um, it's it's not been going uh, very well uh, for the Prime Minister. As you said, the long-awaited Sue Gray report, a very redacted report, only 12 pages, was released today. Um, I don't think um, anything was in the report that uh, the ordinary uh, member of the public or uh, lawmakers weren't expecting. There were unlawful parties, at least um, uh, 12 of them uh, are being investigated by the Metropolitan Police. We believe at least three of these parties um, saw the attendance of Prime Minister Boris Johnson. And now it's 
is Prime Minister Boris Johnson going to resign? He said he won't resign. I believe he did apologise. We've heard the Prime Minister apologise several times over the past couple of weeks. He said to address some of the um, allegations or suggestions, conclusions by Sue Gray was to open up an office for the Prime Minister to have a look at how things are being dealt with at number 10, including um, serious drinking, which is a pretty uh, serious problem for the Prime Minister. Uh, but he remains uh, defiant. I think lots of uh, those who've been speaking, and again, it's still ongoing, have urged the backbenchers, which are now coming out in full force, including former Conservative Prime Minister Theresa May, um, a pretty uh, a popular backbencher, Andrew Mitchell, who have all said that they no longer have confidence in the Prime Minister. Will there be 54 letters of no confidence? I think that's what everybody is going to keep their eyes on now uh, to see whether or not a, a vote of no confidence will be called and the Prime Minister will um, uh, be kicked out of office. Yeah, and I, I did I did wonder about that, uh, Juliana. I mean, with all of the negativity and, you know, the backlash against the Prime Minister, you know, and the parties that he's held, he has admitted to attending some of them. So it, the report really is no surprise. I mean, even the reactions are no surprise. So what happens now? Will the Prime Minister still have a job by the end of the week? Uh, by the end of the week, I think so, yes. Um, the, the problem is, Amaretto, well, it's not a problem because, of course, as many detractors as the Prime Minister has, he's also a very popular leader, as I'm sure you and our viewers know uh, very well. And there are lots of constituents up and down this country that would rather a government just get on with its job. A lot of people are sick to the back teeth of Prime Minister's questions and uh, media reports being constantly dominated by parties. Unfortunately, we know over 150,000 people have lost their lives. And with all of those lives lost, there are families that are grieving. But not everybody was as badly affected by COVID. Lots of people within themselves have broken the rules. Unfortunately uh, for the opposition party members, there are a lot of people that sympathise with Boris Johnson. And I think those backbench MPs who are morally conflicted will be going back to their constituents, will be listening to whether or not they're sick to the back teeth of this and they want to go forward or whether they want Boris Johnson out. And he has been called uh, the, the man with 10 lives. Perhaps this is another life um, that uh, will, will restore him. But we'll just have to uh, wait and see. Of course, he does have this thing hovering over his head, which is a metropolitan police investigation, which is pretty serious in itself. Indeed, indeed, Juliana. But the Prime Minister is not the only one culpable in this. Um, there were other ministers who also attended parties. There were other government people who also attended parties and broke lockdown rules. Is anyone talking about them? Yes and no. We know that uh, Rishi Shunak, uh, the Chancellor, allegedly the successor, was apparently at one of um, these parties, even though Dominic Cummings has been um, a cheerleader for this Sue Gray report and has handed in um, several pieces of evidence, we believe, because we know that the report was de um, detracted, so we don't have all of the evidence. He was at parties. Um, how can you judge with one hand and, um, you know, be uh, sitting uh, with another? So there are several individuals individuals that are in the pipeline. But ultimately, the buck stops with the prime minister. He is the leader of the party. He told millions upon millions of people at the height of lockdown, when people's loved ones were dying, to follow the rules. The vast majority of this country were following the rules, which is why we are managing to get ourselves out of this COVID situation. Unfortunately, those who were making the rules were breaking them. And the only person who is ultimately responsible responsible for that is the Prime Minister. So yes, there may be other names and other individuals um, who have fallen by the sword or who may have attended these parties. But really, if you are Prime Minister of a country, you are supposed to lead. And um, so I don't think um, anybody else is taking any of the blame for the Prime Minister at the moment. Indeed, Juliana. Uh, thank you for joining us. And of course, you'll be following this story uh, for us. We expect more developments, and hopefully more revelations out of the Sugre reports. We'll see you later. Thank you very much. Still ahead on The World Today. China's annual spring festival TV gala begins today. Stay with us for more.
Welcome back to the world today. Here's what we know about the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, the crisis between Ukraine and Russia. 100,000 troops are amassed near the border with Ukraine and Russia. I mean, Russian troops, that is. And just a while ago, we heard at the UN special session today, uh, the US uh, representative to the UN, Linda Thomas Greenfield, saying about 10,000 are already gathered in Belarus already, are preparing... Uh, interestingly, for uh, an invasion of Ukraine. The rest of NATO allies believe that Russia is preparing to invade Ukraine. Uh, Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, says there are no plans to invade Ukraine. Instead, he wants NATO to answer to his demands. No more expansions, he says. And the buildup of military weapons and equipment on the Ukrainian side, he says, is provoking uh, Russia's actions. Uh, nations are calling on both countries uh, to be careful what they say. Uh, residents in Kiev today, however, are hopeful but not convinced that foreign efforts would bring a de-escalation to the international standoff over Russian troops massing on the country's borders. Remember, NATO and uh, European leaders are expected to meet this week uh, to discuss the situation and hopefully seek a diplomatic path to the crisis between Russia and Ukraine. As a Canadian Defence Minister, Anita Anand met with her Ukrainian counterpart, Oleksiy Resinov, today, a day after Canada announced withdrawing all non-essential employees from its embassy in Kiev, a people in the capital went about their daily lives. A lot of them say they don't think that, you know, a war is likely to happen. They understand that people are heated up, people are heating up the situation, but no one wants a war. Everyone, they say, wants a peaceful sky over their heads. Others say um, that any form of help from the outside that improves internal defense uh, capacities will be 100% help in restraining the aggression. Others also say that, you know, foreign powers do not come to Ukraine with good intentions, they're here to push Ukraine towards a war. Others also say that one has to sign the politics part of the Minsk agreements and to implement all the conditions that were written there earlier. Russia, as we said earlier, has massed tens of thousands of troops near its border with Ukraine while denying it plans to attack its neighbor. To another crisis now brewing, but here on the continent, ECOWAS leaders are preparing to visit Burkina Faso this week uh, to discuss with junta uh, leaders over, about returning the country to democratic governance. In my conversation uh, with executive, uh, chief executive of Next Year SBD, Dr. Undu Mokolo, he tells me that certain West African countries need to be more careful now so they do not experience coups. with what Quatara is doing, uh, I have my fears that um, it might experience a military coup. And because of a good neighborhood effect between the region Burkina Faso and Côte d'Ivoire. So I have my fear for Côte d'Ivoire. My next fear is for Republic of Niger. President Mohamed uh, uh, Isafo is enjoying a bit of relative stability because of Nigeria and again, because of uh, President Buhari, who seems to have interest in Niger. If that pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph lives, I mean, if by 2023, President Buhari lives, what will happen? Are we going to have another president that will continue to have interest in Niger? So, and again, he, uh, Niger is experiencing the same kind of um, terrorism and Islamic militarism that you have in Mali, you have in Chad. So the tendency that Niger is in trouble or coup experience one cannot be ruled out. In the meantime, the African Union has suspended Burkina Faso just a week after the military seized power in the coup. It said a country would be blocked from all AU activities until constitutional order is restored. The West Africa Regional Bloc ECOWAS, which suspended Burkina Faso last week, has sent a delegation to the capital, Ouagadougou. It will join a team from the United Nations for talks with the new military leaders. A, an in-person ECOWAS summit is planned for Thursday in Ghana for further deliberations on the 
the situation. Leaders of the regional body held a virtual emergency meeting on Friday where they uh, unanimously suspended a country's membership from the regional bloc. Well, back to Ukraine now. Residents saying earlier that they do not think there will be a crisis in Ukraine or a war between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, joining me now is Nigerian businessman based in Ukraine. Chris Chima joins me from Kharkiv, which is about seven kilom 700 kilometers from Moscow. Chris, thanks for joining me on The World Today. How are you processing what's going on between Russia and Ukraine? Are there any indications where you are that a war is brewing? Good evening. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good. Uh, well, um, um, the city is very calm. Uh, no one is panicking. And um, everything is fine. No sign of war. Well, could that be because the president called on citizens to be more careful what they hear? And we understand that Ukrainian media is also blocking out, you know, talks and reports concerning what's happening at the border with Russia. Could that be why it seems so peaceful in Kharkiv, where you are? Uh, should I say that because of uh, the comment by the president, ever before, before, ever before the president uh, uh, said that everybody should be calm, everybody has always been calm because... Uh, um, many people, I have, um, so I have uh, lots of uh, Russian friends, and uh, I've gone to them to ask them one or two things. I said, do you think uh, a war was going to break out here anytime soon? And they all laugh and drink vodka and say nothing like that is going to happen. So before the president made that statement, everywhere has been calm. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. And do continue to stay safe in Kharkiv. Uh, we'll reach out to you later on to get more on what's happening in Russia. Uh, in Ukraine, beg your pardon. And as we end the world today, China's annual Spring Festival TV Gala, hosted by China Media Group, CMG, opened today on the eve of the Chinese Lunar New Year of the Tiger. A marathon variety show which includes singing, dancing, acrobatics, comedy sketches and traditional Chinese art forms such as uh, Peking Opera is an integral part of China's celebrations for the Lunar New Year with hundreds of millions of people tuning in to enjoy the visual feast. Well, there you have it. 2022 has officially begun in China. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubadi.